We'll call to order um, this hearing of the Minnesota Senate Taxes Committee, Tuesday, April 9th, uh, 2024, um, 8.32 a.m. The first um, item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of two hearings. Um, first, draw your attention to the uh, minutes for Wednesday, April 3rd. Are there any corrections to the minutes for April 3rd? Seeing none and without objection, the minutes from April 3rd are approved as presented. Um, secondly, um, we have before us the <coughs> minutes from Thursday, April 4th. Are there corrections to the minutes for April 4th? Seeing none, without objection, the minutes for April 4th are also approved as presented. Um, we have um, Senator Pa with us uh, to present Senate File uh, 5118. Uh, um, Senator Pa, on your behalf, Senator Klein offers the um, A3 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Well, thank you down there. Appreciate that. All opposed? Um, the uh, motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Um, Senator Pa. Uh, it's just one section in your bill. If you would just um, tell us what that section says. Thank you, Chair Russ and members. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about my bill, uh, 5118. What this bill does is it appropriates 5% of the 80% that, that is distributed to the general fund to the Commissioner of Children, Youth, and Families for youth cannabis education, use prevention, early intervention, and treatment of cannabis use. So under current law, 80% of the revenues from the 10% cannabis gross receipts taxes is deposited to the general fund, and then 20% is deposited to the local government cannabis aid account in the special revenue fund. What this bill aims to do uh, Chair Rass and members, is that it aims to make sure that we protect the public health and safety of our young people. With the passing of legalized cannabis last session, questions regarding how we protect and support our young people have come up. And one thing we want to take a look at is the early use of cannabis and how that affects the adolescent brain development and also the effects and impacts of that on our young people. Minnesota has a population of over 5.7 million people. Of that, the ages of 10 to 24, which is most impacted, is 1.1 million. So that's nearly one fifth of the population that is our young people who would be growing up in uh, a state with legalized cannabis and for the first time uh, would also be impacted by those laws. There's no doubt that there are benefits to cannabis, uh, but there's also negative impacts that we have to consider, especially around our young people. Last year's cannabis bill included some investments for youth prevention and education in the amount of $5 million to the department, the Minnesota Department of Health for youth education, and then another $300,000 to schools and districts. But the current investment is simply not enough, and that's why this bill is coming forward. Most importantly, nothing has been allocated towards early intervention programs and treatment of cannabis use among youth. 
And that's what we're here asking for, is this 5% dedicated funds that would go to the um, Children, Youth, and Families Department that would fund these programs. Madam Chair and members, I do have some testifiers uh, that are joining us virtually. I've had the honor to have the opportunity to work with young leaders in our community. They have formed a group specifically to address cannabis among youth. And that is the Cannabis Awareness and Education Council for Youth. It is a youth-centered community organization. And through that work, they have also worked with other youth-centered community organizations in our community to talk about and to discuss um, no. ideas for how we can address cannabis among youth and their safety. Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Senator Paul. Um, before we hear from your testifiers, I draw members' attention to the uh, <clears throat> to the revenue um, estimate. Um, this bill is not going to stay in taxes, nor will it be counted against our uh, target. Um, but I did want you to know what um, what the impact is. Uh, it's going to be um, moved to the committee on finance. Um, <clears throat> But um, we show from the Department of Revenue <clears throat> um, the um, um, the expenditure <clears throat> of eight hundred thousand for fiscal year twenty five, and then increasing after that. Currently, it will really only be applying to the um, the hemp products because we have not um, finalized the action on the overall bill uh, <clears throat> on the uh, cannabis bill um, and that tax is not not due just yet because you can't you can't make it or sell it except um, on uh, tribal uh, on tribal lands mm -hmm. um, I uh, just to comment on your uh, <clears throat> on your amendment although it's an author's amendment I I um, I think it was a good idea to uh, send those dollars to, or to be considered at least, in the Finance Committee to the new Department of Children, Youth, and Families and to keep it out of the Human Services uh, jurisdiction. So thank you very much for that. Um, so you have two testifiers, uh, Darian uh, Lofton and Emmett Dysert, and they are both on Zoom. Um, Darian Lofton, if you would um, identify yourself, please, for the uh, record, we'll, we are pleased to have your testimony. Um, <clears throat> hi, Chair Rest and members of the committee. I'm, I am Darian Lofton. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to testify today. Uh, I'd much rather be there in person with you all, but I'm an attending a conference out of state um, focused on youth leadership and after school. Um, but as I said, my name is Darian Lofton and I'm a founding member of the Cannabis Awareness and Education Council for Youth, um, otherwise known as CAPE. And I'm here to testify in support of F118, F511, SF5118, excuse me. Um, CAKE was started to bring young people's voices into policy conversations about the implementation of recreational cannabis uh, in Minnesota. And the recreational cannabis law that passed last session impacts young people that are, um, and there are policy components directly about young people, and yet young people were not formally at the table um, to share perspectives. So through Kate, my colleagues, um, Emmett, who well, you all will meet soon um, in a minute, and then three other young people met regular, regularly to read and learn as much as we could about Minnesota's new cannabis, uh, recreational cannabis law. Our goal was to understand the parts of the bill that impacted young people, and then to find out what young people think about cannabis and inform them about what we had learned. 
Um, we conducted five listening sessions, mostly with high school students and some college stage students in Northfield, Faribault, and the Twin Cities. Through these conversations with young people, we learned that they have many misconceptions about the impacts of cannabis use under the age of 24. Um, many believe that because it's a plant it's and it's natural that sometimes use and sometimes use medicinally that cannabis use is safer than tobacco and it'd be okay for them. Uh, especially as young people work through depression and anxiety coming out of a global pandemic, we want to ensure that cannabis is not used as a way to self-medicate. Um, and many young people we have talked to were surprised to hear that the negative were surprised to hear that cannabis can negatively impact um, young people's brain development under the age of 24. Uh, Senate file at 5118 is critically important to ensure we have adequate uh, resources to dedicate to youth cannabis use and prevention and early intervention and treatment of cannabis use with a priority on peer-to-peer -peer education. The level of funding appropriated last legislative session towards youth education would not go far enough to meet the needs and the uphill climb we have to dispel misinformation that young people have that will impact their health and well-being. Uh, Senate file 5118 will dedicate 5% of 80% of the 80% of gross revenue to ensure that 1.1 million young people in Minnesota ages 10 to 24 have access to effective and relevant information about the impacts of cannabis. Um, while Minnesota student surveys focuses on uh, broadly on alcohol and drug use and opposed to cannabis uh, use specifically, we know that the percentage of students using controlled substance suggests higher the older uh, the students are. For example, 20% of eighth graders and 23% of ninth graders and 37% of 11th graders have used controlled substance in the past year. Our goal is to make stronger investments in providing young people with the education they need uh, to see that number go down in each age group. I know I now want to turn it over to my colleague, Emmett, uh, who can share a little bit more about uh, some of the information I've shared with you. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lofton. Uh, next, we have Emmett Dysart. Um, if you would identify yourself for, for the record, we um, welcome your testimony. Thank you. My name is Emmett Dysart, for the record. And this is my testimony. Chair Rest and members of the committee, thank you so much for allowing me to testify remotely. Like Darian, I'm also in an out-of-state conference, but on the other side of the conference, country and New York. I've been working with Darian and other young people uh, since this past September to dig into Minnesota's new recreational cannabis law and to figure out policy approaches to ensure young people's needs and how we can center our approach in Minnesota. I'm here to testify, testify in support of SF5118. In this bill, we request that the funds be administered by the Minnesota's new state agency, the Department of Children and Youth and Families. A key focus of DCYF is to lead programs for children and youth from intentional prevention to downstream services, creating space for investment in students outside of the classroom and in their community. DCYF's primary role is, be, is to invest in asset-based approaches before the problem begins rather than the downstream, or excuse me, the agency will focus on upstream solutions rather than downstream public safety and correction interventions. And they are also there to coordinate across child welfare, mental health, and other youth-related state agencies so that they there's a unified and coordinated approach to meeting the needs of young people and families. We also want to approach to youth prevention and be grounded in youth-centered community-based organizations that center youth voices and engagement. 
We believe that the most effective ambassadors of truthful information on the impact of cannabis use under age 24 are young people themselves. Adolescents are deeply influenced by their peers. We believe that DCYF will take an approach that will bring young people to the table in the design and education and prevention approaches. We would like to see peer-to-peer -peer education and investment in community-based organizations and schools that are using youth leadership approaches so that we build the skill, skills of young people to educate other young people. With the legalization of recreational cannabis in Minnesota, we have a responsibility to ensure that all of our citizens, especially the youngest of us, have access to information so that they make informed decisions about their own well-being. We all have a responsibility to ensure that young people are not making decisions that have a long-term impact on their brain development because they lack adequate information and resources. In order to meet the needs of young people in Eli, Grand Rapids, Moorhead, Twin Cities, Wilmer, and Albert Lee, we must invest sufficient resources to ensure this happens. Speaking candidly, the five million that was originally allocated to this process is a joke. We feel that 5% of the 80% of the investment to make to our youngest citizens is fair. Finally, I just wanna bring up the, that currently right now across the Metro, there are tobacco stores within walking distances of high schools and middle schools that are selling high potency THC flour to our youth. I know and can attest to this from witnessing it personally. My nephew, who is in eighth grade at Northeast Middle School in Minneapolis, has been targeted and offered baits, edibles, and other THC-related products several times by corner store employees and the illicit market. Thankfully, my nephew has been prepared for these kinds of experiences, but not every kid has. And as time passes, we need ongoing education so the facts are on the forefront of their minds so that, that when the opportunity presents itself, they will be prepared. We want to thank you all for your time and your thoughtful consideration on Senate File 5118. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dysord. Are there questions or comments for either Mr. Lofton or Mr. Dysord? Senator Klein. Thank you, Chair and Senator Pata. Senator Pata, thanks for bringing the bill forward. I know you had a profile of bills this year that sort of addressed protections for youth around cannabis. Many of them were referred to the <clears throat> Commerce Committee, and we weren't able to get to them this year. But I, now that I see your testifiers, I see why you've sort of grabbed this issue and are uh, addressing it, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> My first question was answered by your testifiers. You know, how would this interact with the funding that we passed for this purpose last year, and it sounds like the impression is that that was simply not adequate and, and more resources are needed. Um, uh, and I just, I, I don't see anybody in the audience from the Office of Cannabis Management. I would be interested to see if they had a, a position on this bill. I assume they're neutral on how we spend our general fund revenues, but um, it, maybe at finance when it comes past there, we can just get them to weigh in on the bill. So thank you, Senator Fine. Um, <clears throat> Senator Klein. Um, would it be your preference for the bill to go to commerce before, before um, finance? Uh, let me confer, Chair, with uh, my staff, and I'll get back to you on that answer. We're going to act on it right now. No, we'll pass. We'll pass. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Senator Klein. Um, are there other uh, questions or comments for Senator Pa? Um, Senator um, Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to express my support and thanks to Senator Pa as well as the young people who have organized around this issue and brought this uh, to us and told their stories. I think it's uh, extremely important information for us to receive and important, important and powerful stories that we heard. And I think this is this should be an important priority from the resources that we're generating from this new policy of ours. And, um, you know, I was the chief author of the medical cannabis bill. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but never represented, uh, even while I supported adult use, um, that uh, cannabis is completely benign and doesn't have its consequences uh, in, in negative and very negative in some people's lives. So 
this is an important step forward to take to have really focused effort on, on the part of and on behalf of young people. And it's especially heartening that young people are leading this charge to make this request of us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Um, thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, before we um, take a motion to uh, send the bill to finance, Senator Pomp, I'm going to request that even though the bill is not going to commerce, that you keep um, Senator uh, Klein and his staff um, aware of the progress um, of the bill at every stop, and if it's included in any omnibus bill, that they're aware of that. Madam Chair, I certainly will. Thank you. Senator Klein then uh, moves that Senate file, oh, unless there's anyone else, Senate file 5118 as amended um, be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee um, on Finance. Thank you very much, Senator Pop. Thank you, Next Madam Chair. Next on our agenda members. is Senate file 4483, Senator Umu Verbatim. Oh. I guess we have to vote on that motion. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but you don't need to come back to the table. Um, Senator Klein's, on Senator Klein's uh, motion that Senate File 5118 as amended be recommended to pass and uh, refer to the Committee on Finance. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The uh, motion prevails and the um, um, the motion prevails. The next bill is Senate File 4483. Is Senator Mover Baton here? Here she comes. Is this being handed out now? Yes, everybody has it. Everybody has it. Um, <laughs> Senator Mover Baton, we um, have before Senate File. 4483. Um, this bill, as, as members can see, has been <clears throat> to a number of committees. We are only looking at the, um, uh, the provisions that have to do with the um, exchange of information uh, with the um, Department of Revenue, and we're taking no public testimony. Um, Senator Umuva Baton, if you would uh, direct our attention to the provisions in your bill, only those provisions that deal with the um, uh, the Department of Revenue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, anything that might be helpful, just really briefly to give you. Um, an overview of what the bill does, and then I'm happy to go into those sections. Just those provisions yes. that then deal with uh, the Department of Revenue. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, so employer misclassification fraud, which this bill is tackling, um, occurs when employers mislabel employees as independent contractors to avoid their responsibility to provide their workers guaranteed protections like overtime pay, minimum wage, unemployment insurance, paid family, medical leave, earned sick and safe time, and more. So that's um, what the issue is. Um, our state agencies sort of have a disjointed approach right now. Different agencies are responsible for different forms of enforcement. I'll focus today on talking about the enforcement um, from the Department of Revenue, uh, but the other agencies that do enforce um, uh, the employer misclassification fraud are the Department of Labor, Economic uh, Employment and Economic Development, Commerce, and the Attorney General's Office. Um, de the Department of Revenue is really looking at taxes, right, income tax withholding. Um, and what the uh, Office Legislator Auditor Report, as well as the task force that the Attorney General had on this issue showed is that we really need better coordination, a whole of government approach. Um, and so this bill establishes an intergovernmental misclassification enforcement and education partnership to increase coordination and collaboration among those five different government entities that I mentioned, including, of course, the Department of Revenue um, for investigating misclassification fraud. So if we go into the bill and um, I uh, have gone through and, and just sort of 
want to focus the conversation on the pieces that are relevant for the tax committee. Council can, can jump in if I'm wrong, but I wanted to be really sure to make sure there was anything that sort of touches taxes here. Um, the first place that where we do see that is in section seven. So this is the general misclassification of employees. Um, and then specifically subdivision five, um, we're referencing the statute um, 181.722, um, and this section allows for you to go to court for civil damages and penalties for misclassification. And then um, if a court does find that violation of the section, they need to send those findings to the Department of Labor, who can then um, report those findings to the Department of Revenue, uh, as well as the IRS. So that's one of the places it shows up. Um, then we move to section eight. Um, which uh, continues to look at that same, um, uh, I'm sorry, looks at the independent contractor test for construction now. Um, and then if we go to subdivision four, uh, which actually lists out the factors in the test. Previously, one of the factors um, was holding a federal employer identification number um, or filing business or self-employment income tax returns with the IRS. And this just now really clarifies that um, in the new language Senator, to say. <clears throat> Senator Humover Baden, those two provisions do not reference the Department of Revenue. If, if you could move quickly to, to the provisions that deal with the um, Department of Revenue, which I understand are sections 10, 11, and 12. Yes. Um, Madam Chair, there is a little bit of rulemaking in that section as well. So just to be safe, I did want to mention anywhere I saw Department of Revenue come up. Um, so if you look at subdivision 13 in section 8, there is a little bit of rulemaking for the Department of Revenue. Um, and then in subdivision 15 there as well, just clarifying that, um, again, when there's those violations that the Department of Revenue needs to be notified. Um, then we can move to section nine, which is the actual intergovernmental misclassification enforcement and education partnership act, um, where you'll first see the Department of Revenue named, um, just def it's just defining the partnership entities. And then section 10 goes on to talk about the composition, again, listing the Department of Revenue. Um, in subdivision three of that section, you'll see the roles, and it clarifies exactly what the Department of Revenue's enforcement authority is, um, which is under chapters 289A and 290. Um, Department of Revenue can, can speak more directly to that. Um, and then uh, there is some information in section 11 about chapter 270B, which is tax data, um, uh, subdivision uh, 17 does um, allow for some better data sharing again with agencies. So the Department of Commerce has this enforcement authority for um, commerce fraud and then says Department of Revenue could provide them with the information they would need to um, investigate compliance. And then it adds another subdivision 23 for that sort of similar disclosure to the Attorney General's office. Uh, and then section, um, section 22 also references chapter 270C. Um, so just saying that the commissioner can um, revoke licenses if that chapter has been violated um, or a final order from the Department of Revenue. And then chapter, I'm sorry, section 25, um, there are some, again, just some references to the employer um, identification numbers, Minnesota tax identification numbers, just want to make the committee aware. Um, subdivision eight uh, really uh, refers to the how the data is classified and then just clarifies that the labor commissioner can use data from that contractor registration um, for investigations and enforcement and then share it with departments like the Department of Revenue. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Mover-Baden. 
Once again, I draw members' attention to the jurisdiction of this committee or sections um, um, 10, 11, and 12. Are there uh, questions for or comments for Senator Verbaden with regard to sections 10, 11, and 12? <clears throat> um, um, seeing none, I will call forward uh, Ms. Bears from the Department of, of, um, of Revenue. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Joanna Bears. I'm the Legislative Director at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. We'll be very brief. We just want to say our appreciation um, to the author and our colleagues who have been working on this bill. Um, I do want to highlight the two, the major things that change for the Department of Revenue in this bill is one, it adds us to this working group, and then two, it provides data sharing with Commerce and the AG's office. Those are two new additions than what we already currently have approval for. So most of the agencies in that partnership we already share information with. Okay, are there any um, questions or comments from Ms. Bears? Uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Bears, um, can you do briefly describe to us with the changes that are made in this bill, what are the changes in responsibilities for the Department of Revenue? Ms. Bears. Uh, Senator, uh, Ch Chair Rest, Senator Weber. Uh, most of the changes would be attending this partnership group and kind of working through that process. And then it would be, um, you know, doing a data sharing agreement and then disclosing information if we identify misclassification. But those are things that we currently do is when we identify misclassification, so it would just be sharing that information. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. So under current the current situation. Uh, is it primarily the Department of Revenue that's responsible for, for making determinations and, and providing the, the guidance for this area? Ms. Bears. Uh, Chair Rest, Senator Weber. Uh, we determine this when we go through our current withholding audits, so we don't necessarily actively go and look for misclassification. Senator yeah. Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so currently, how is misclassification then discovered? Ms. Bears. Uh, Chair Rest, Senator Weber, if we're doing an audit on an employer to verify that withholding's been paid or withholding has not been paid, that's how it's discovered on, within the department ourselves. Madam, Madam Chair. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. With this intergovernmental grouping right now, we've basically added another step to the process. And I would say, Madam Chair and members, that currently, I would say one of the criticisms of, of uh, employers uh, is that the rules are complicated. And, as, and leads to some confusion as to classification. And I'm not sure this bill is doing anything to lessen that confusion, but rather is going to add to it. And, and, um, uh, and I guess recognizing that, that there's this change going on with the department, from the Department of Revenue to an expanded group, um, I'm not sure at the end of the day that the amount of confusion that will be created uh, is going to be worth the effort. Madam Chair. Uh, just a moment. Um, okay. And so uh, at this point, that's all I have to say, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, any further comments or Senator Umar Vibaden or Ms. Barris, did you want to respond? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I think, um, again, the OLA report as well as the Attorney General's um, task force to show that we do need better collaboration. Um, and so, you know, the I think part of the confusion is that it is so disjointed and there are pieces of enforcement that multiple agencies hold. Um, so for them to work together in this partnership, I think is really helpful for employers and for workers to kind of have that one place to go to, um, whether they're talking about 
um, workers' compensation or unemployment insurance or tax withholding. Um, that's all part of misclassification. I also just want to share if there are more questions about um, sort of those rules on the tests. Um, the uh, Commissioner of Labor, Nicole Blissenbach, is also here and happy to answer questions. Thank you. And I'm Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, one last comment I think I would make is that it seems to me, and, and, and this is in a section outside of the ones you referenced, so forgive me, but they, there's also a redefinition of those items uh, that create uh, independent, an independent contractor status e example. And it seems to me we're varying from what the federal guidelines are. And every time we do that within the state, start to differentiate our rules as opposed to federal rules, uh, I, we're creating that additional confusion of which I earlier spoke. So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Weber. Any further uh, discussion? Um, then, um, Senator Klein, um, this bill needs to go to uh, finance. Senator Klein moves that Senate file um, 4483 be recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on Finance. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The motion prevails. Um, the next bill on our agenda, thank you very much, Senator Umu for Baton, and Senate File 5191, Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble. Senator Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity 91. to present Senate File 5191. I would also like to thank my co-authors, Senator Seberger, Her, and Abler. Um, very quickly, by way of ver uh, very broad brushstroke overview, what Senate File 5191 seeks to do is to help homeowners uh, remove uh, infested ash trees that have been that have been infected by the emerald ash borer with the cost of removing those trees uh, when those trees have been uh, diagnosed and cited for removal um, by public authorities. Um, Madam Chair, as we are all aware, emerald ash borer has become a very, very uh, clear threat and danger uh, to the ash trees and the ash forests of Minnesota. Minnesota has upwards of a billion ash trees this is gonna be a, a very, very dire circumstance for us. It's probably inevitable, but the best we can do at this time is to try to slow the march and the progress of the disease down. Um, maybe uh, time that we buy uh, by slowing it down uh, will help us find alternatives either replacing ash trees uh, with something uh, better, um, yeah, particularly in the, in the in the northern part of our state where it's gonna have very, very dire implications for um, our forests and our, and our water table and, um, and everything that goes with the ecosystems up there um, and or find uh, better, more cost-effective ways to treat ash trees. Uh, Madam Chair, this problem has come to light in particular in the areas of the city where um, ash trees on private property have been cited and they cost upwards of two to um, $4,000 for each tree uh, to remove, um, and that becomes um, untenable and impossible. If a tree is not removed, it then gets removed by the public authorities, and, and then uh, that cost is put onto, as a special assessment, onto the taxes of that particular uh, property. So the goal is to help those, particularly those uh, who lack the means to, to um, pay uh, two to $4,000 the bill, as it's uh, currently proposed, um, would be a tax credit up to 50% of the cost of the tree removal, uh, limited to $1,000, uh, and, and the credit at this point would be non-refundable. Um, and so the full realization of the $1,000 would depend on um, the individual's tax liability, of course. So that's the top level uh, overview. Um, Tom Olson, who is a park board commissioner the, in, in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board is tasked with managing 
the ash tree issue. Um, we've removed, I think, the vast majority of ash trees in the public realm, um, but uh, many, many remain on private property. Um, and they're tasked with identifying and citing those trees for and marking them for removal. So with that, I have Commissioner Olson. Uh, thank you very much, Senator um, Dibble. Are there questions for Senator Dibble before we move to the testifier? Seeing none, um, <clears throat> uh, welcome to the committee. Um, Mr. Mr. Olson, if you would, uh, Commissioner, if you would identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Chair Rest and committee members. My name is Tom Olson, and I serve as one of the at-large commissioners of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Uh, so the Minneapolis Park and Recre Recre uh, Recreation Board governs and administers over 7,000 acres of land and water in a in, in adjacent to the city of Minneapolis. Under the city charter, the park board is responsible for planning, maintenance, and caring for all boulevard trees, as well as the trees within our park system within the city. Also under state law and by concurrent ordinance between the city of Minneapolis and the park board, we are assigned to the responsibility to deal with invasive pests and species. And as you all know, the emerald ash borer is uh, one of those species. So over the years, the park board has inspected all sorts of trees on private property as we work to fulfill our legal responsibility. And this ash borer problem is one of the great, greatest that we have ever faced. Um, so the infestation started in 2009 when the infected, uh, when infected pulpwood, we think, was brought to a recycling facility in St. Paul, and it has spread from there. Uh, in the city of Minneapolis, it started in the south part of our city, which is generally more wealthy, and it slowly worked up north, where it has now reached uh, a, a community that has census tracts that are lower in household income than generally the rest of the city, and it's really starting to um, devastate that community. And so if, as residents have received these notices and been advised that they need to treat or remove the tree, more and more community members have expressed how harm, harmful these unplanned expenses are. Uh, the fact is that many of our residents living uh, in that area are living paycheck to paycheck, and unplanned expenses that can reach into the thousands are really difficult to absorb. Uh, after all, it's something like 56% of Americans uh, can't afford an expense, uh, an emergency expense of $1,000 or more. Uh, so it's really a universal problem. Uh, if a homeowner does not remove or treat an infected tree on their own, the park board takes the initiative to remove the tree to help slow the spread of the pest. Um, we hire a contractor at the lowest bid available to remove the tree. The homeowners are responsible for the cost, and the park board is responsible for notifying the homeowner of the cost and the procedure. Uh, we are able to lengthen the amount of time uh, in which assessment can be spread up to 20 years, but it can still really be difficult for a lot of folks to be able to afford this process. Uh, and ultimately, uh, as Senator D uh, Dibble mentioned, if the homeowner does not pay the cost, the cost is assessed to their property as a special assessment. Um, the park board, we've worked really hard to try to find alternatives to paying for this. Ultimately, within our own budget, we aren't able to afford it. We've uh, received a one-time grant from the Margaret A. Cargill Fund of the St. Paul, Minnesota Foundation to help home homeowners with removal. We have also worked to uh, seek grants from the U.S. Forest Service uh, and with the city of Minneapolis uh, to mitigate this problem. But even with all these efforts and various tactics, we are finding that this issue continues to negatively impact residents, and we all need a bit more help managing this problem. Um, but the fact is, as Senator uh, Dibble, Dibble mentioned, uh, despite our best efforts, the emerald ash borer continues to spread across the state. It's now in 50 counties across the state. Uh, Minneapolis ash trees um, at one point accounted for um, nearly a third, but more or less a, a quarter of our total uh, tree canopy within our park and boulevard system. It's now in the low single digits, trending towards zero. And so you can only imagine what that's gonna do for the rest of the state. And if our winters continue to warm, we'll have fewer deep freezing temperatures, uh, which kill the ash borer larvae. Those have really, the winter has really been our greatest defense. Uh, so meaning the spread will increase and be faster. But either way, the press will, pest will spread. And ultimately, Senator, senators, my message to you is the question is not if your community and constituents will be harmed by this issue, it's when. In the end, this issue will impact every single community in the state. Uh, that's why we very much support Senator Dibble's uh, Senate File 5191 and would ask that you all support this legislation so we can secure the help that all our constituents need. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very uh, much, um, Mr. Olson. Senator uh, Dibble, the, the bill, um, although your uh, testifiers seem to be more um, uh, metro-focused, um, the bill applies to the whole state, Madam and um, uh, and 
it is um, a cost of uh, over $26 million uh, uh, ongoing, which, which is a huge, a huge um, price tag that probably is not doable this year. But what I think it shows is just how widespread this problem is. And we have recently been reading, I think, uh, um, Senator Housechild's not in the room right this second, but of <clears throat> the um, uh, northern Minnesota now is, well, he's back. In northern Minnesota is experiencing uh, the devastation of the emerald ash borer um, as well that may well eclipse uh, um, because of the, of, um, uh, the devastation, if not the cost, because a lot of, lot of the, um, <clears throat> a lot of the trees are on public lands, but it will be a cost certainly, to, um, uh, to, um, to remove them. Um, but um, the, um, I think that Senator Dibbled, um, and we'll certainly will hear from the other folks, but. The revenue analysis is very, very telling about the devastation um, that um, that the magnitude of which leads to this huge um, this huge revenue um, estimate, and that um, uh, if you look at the third bullet point, 54 percent of the ash trees removals are assumed to be on private residential property and they are um, uh, and they are limited the credit is limited to individual homeowners uh, so um, um, uh, those entities that own apartment buildings that have emerald ash borers on them that are not on the on the public right of way um, they don't get relief here but even if it's only limited to to homeowners it is once again a um, a huge cost and the um, um, so all of those considerations have been taken into account for um, for um, for the um, the revenue um, estimate and they're assuming uh, the last bullet point, um, uh, it's going to be the same every year going forward, probably as much for the ability to remove them um, is, um, is limited. And that's happening in um, all over the metropolitan area. Um, uh, in my own neighborhood, um, uh, there is a fund that the city of New Hope uses, and it is quickly exhausted um, just for the boulevard trees. Um, and um, a number of years ago, there were, um, there were programs that local governments used to encourage um, uh, residents to replace the trees at the city's expense um, that were on the um, the on on the boulevard if the if the trees could be taken down before they were marked as as diseased um, and um, it's really an important effort uh, Senator Dibble and I really um, I really um, appreciate it and once again this is this is a statewide issue it is not simply a Minneapolis <clears throat> or St. Paul issue as we know that the ash trees were um, um, were favored after um, after the um, devastation of the elm trees from Dutch Dutch elm disease that were the the, the uh, favored um, um, boulevard tree. Um, I have a um, an ash tree in my backyard, the kind that is subject to the emerald ash borer, and I started treating it about 10 years ago, and it remains healthy and giving me uh, the, the shade and the, um, um, and the, um, uh, the visual 
um, barrier uh, so that my neighbors don't have to look at my back backyard and I don't have to look at theirs. Um, but um, it, you know, it's an annual cost, but um, I believe it's, it's worth it. But the rest of them have to come down that are diseased. So um, it's just a huge cost. Um, Senator Klein and then Senator Weber. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for the bill. I also have a personal experience with the issue. Our home in Mendota Heights had two majestic uh, ash trees in the front yard, original to the property from the 1940s. Uh, and in the span of two years, you know, they turned into these hulking skeletons that were a risk to the property, and, and we took them down. Um, uh, hearing the chair's uh, intimation that this may be something that doesn't get done this year, but maybe gets done in future years, I have a couple of thoughts on the bill. Um, first of all, I think my property in Mendota Heights is probably not your target audience for this credit, uh, and maybe we want to put some sort of uh, income limit on the credit um, so that it, it goes to the people, as you mentioned, who really cannot afford this uh, one-time expense for removal. Uh, and then the other um, thought I would have is, uh, in, the eye, in the interest of sort of not clear-cutting our state of ash trees without any sort of... Uh, replacement and, and thoughts of climate uh, change, et cetera. I wonder if we could work in some language to this bill about uh, cost of replacement as well as uh, removal uh, so that we try to credit and incentivize uh, continued foliage in our state. Thanks. Um, Senator Chair. Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> as regards your comments, uh, 50 years ago this summer, I actually manned the booth at the county fair because Dutch elm disease was in the middle of its uh, devastation at that point. And, um, and what were most of our elm, our elm trees replaced with? Ash trees, you yeah. know. And so, uh, I, and quite frankly, uh, Dutch elm disease, or Dutch elm, uh, emerald ash borer has made its way into southern Minnesota as well. Um, the one thing, I, a couple, two points I wanted to question here. As I look at the revenue estimate, it, it talks about single-family residential properties. However, uh, we do this is there's nothing within the bill that limits this to single-family residential properties, in my opinion. Uh, the bill uh, talks about the individual income tax credit. I may have a, a commercial property as an individual income tax uh, payer on which I run my business, and that could have uh, trees on it, or I could, uh, I could have a, you know, a, a fourplex in which I live, so I'm a homeowner, mm -hmm. uh, but um, at that point, there's nothing, in, in my opinion, in the legislation that says this has to be only a single-family unit, so, and I would just have a question for the author if that's his intent or... Because if that's the case, I think that the estimate is probably understated um, mm. based on that. Um, Senator Dibble, there's a lot of interest in your bill. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, I Madam will, Chair. I will point out as, as irony that the, um, the type of tree that I replaced my um, boulevard tree with is a disease-resistant American elm tree. And it has thrived. <laughs> uh, Senator Dill. So, Mentor, I wanted to respond to a few things that have been said by you, and Senator Klein and Senator Weber, and also we have some other testifiers sure. um, who we'll get would to like them. to share. So, very, very quickly, um, absolutely, uh, Senator Klein, um, I believe this bill, as proposed, can be targeted, it can be scaled, um, it can be focused more if need be. Um, uh, $26 million is a, is a big chunk. Um, don't know if the chair is willing to donate uh, more than half of her target to this bill or not. <laughs> but uh, or we can ship the bill over to someone else's uh, committee and you know maybe have the environment committee pick up the target. Um, but uh, absolutely, you know, this bill can be can be moved and shaped in any way that we see fit. Um, I'm glad you pointed out it's not solely targeted at just uh, uh, single-family residential homeowners. It's you know it, the term is taxpayers. It's used in the bill. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, the policy discussion, of course, is um, the interest, the public's interest that served is getting as many ash trees removed from private proper property 
um, as quickly as possible, and where are the constraints in so doing. And if it, prove, it would prove to expedite um, by helping even those sorts of, of property owners uh, to get their trees removed, um, I'm for it. If it looks like we're maybe not targeting our money in a way that gets the biggest bang for the buck, then maybe we should focus it along the lines of uh, what Senator Klein has to say. And then, Madam Chair, I just want to respond um, to, to both your comment and Senator Weber's uh, comment. It, it is a shame that we immediately went to the ash tree and in Minneapolis, we lined those those streets up with ash trees on both sides and then what do you know, emerald ash borer comes along. I think in Minneapolis now we're a little bit more enlightened and we vary the types of trees that, that line our streets now with the replacement trees so that if something comes through the entire streetscape isn't completely wiped out because trees are more than just aesthetic. They provide uh, you know, tremendous environmental and public health benefits in terms of shade and, and quality of life, et cetera. So that's all from me for right now. We have a uh, council member Ellison who would like to share a few thoughts and then two residents if you have time, Madam Chair, um, who will just want to share just a minute or two of their, their perspective. Uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. I'll call up your uh, next um, <clears throat> Um, testifiers, um, Amoke Kubat. Hmm? I'm sorry. Um, next, uh, Chair Jeremiah Bay Ellison. I have the I have the uh, testifiers in the wrong order. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee, um, Council Member. We're pleased to have your testimony. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Jeremiah Ellison. I represent Ward 5 in Minneapolis uh, on the Minneapolis City Council. Um, and, uh, you know, you all, I don't want to preach at you all. You all seem to have a pretty uh, good command of this issue and how it's affecting the, the entire state. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, when, when we talk about the cost burden of removal for these trees, um, you know, North Minneapolis is not the only place in the state that's cost burdened uh, by these removals, <laughs> right? And so I think it's good for us to have a statewide, statewide approach. Um, but the costs can be really exorbitant to folks. Um, and unlike an aged tree or even like a lightning strike that might hit, it's random, uh, this is an issue that is swept across the city and is sort of affecting people all at once, right? And, uh, and, and this infestation, the emerald ash borer, it doesn't care if the tree is on public land, it doesn't care if the tree is on private land, uh, it's sweeping across, uh, across our city. We've had uh, residents of North Minneapolis who have faced expenses up to $30,000 for removal. Um, and so when we talk about the cost burden, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it can be very, very high. Um, this is not just an issue about trees. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's an environmental issue. It's an issue about tree canopy. Uh, but when we talk about removals being high enough to remove people from their ability to be stable in their, in their place of living, uh, it's also kind of a housing issue. It's a, it's a, it's a housing stability issue. And so um, that's what the issues become, at least in North Minneapolis. And I'm just speaking from that perspective. And so I appreciate Senator Dibble bringing this forward. And I, uh, you, know, you guys will hear some, from some folks, some residents of Minneapolis who have been directly affected by this issue. But I wanted to give you that that broader perspective of how this issue has affected uh, at least North Minneapolis, uh, the area that I represent. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, um, Council Member. Are there questions or comments for Council Member Ellison? Then we will go to Amoke Kubat. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, that is my mother, and she was in a lot of pain today and wasn't able to come. She has arthritis. I actually have arthritis, too. It was very hard to park and get into this building. So I hopefully I can have more than two minutes because I'm coming all the way from the north side. And um, I just hope you give me a chance. I'm going to read my mother's um, letter. But first, I just want to say our communities were treated very differently. And half of the condemnations that happened in Minneapolis happened in North Minneapolis. We weren't given an opportunity to treat our trees. We weren't given an opportunity to have receipts or proof that our trees were infested. Um, just try to picture yourselves if a black inspector came onto your property and then was trying to charge you anywhere from $4,000 to $13,000 for a tree. My mom, I'm speaking in my mom's you know, voice because she wrote, <laughs> sorry. I purchased my home on January 8th, 2021. On January 15th, 
Dave, an inspector for the Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Board, was in my backyard outlining a large tree with green paint. Questioning his presence and behavior, Dave informed me that this tree was infested with emerald ash borer. It had to be cut down in 60 days. He gave me a card with a phone number to start the process. When I told him I had only lived in my home for a week, Dave said, oh yeah, there was a for sale sign in the yard when I was here last week, bless you. I said, that must have been some conversation with you and the previous owners. The for sale sign is still leaning against the deck, Dave said, and he, bless you, and he said, yeah, that happens a lot. I was never given an option to do anything to save this tree. I was told if I couldn't pay the full amount of the cost, an interest would be added to my property taxes in the form of a lien. I had five years to pay it. It took nine months to get the tree removed. Contractors came and went, informing me it was a huge tree and needed special equipment to move. Cost range from 2,000 to 10,000. To date, there has been no evidence that the tree was infected. The tree was lush and beautiful. It provided shade during the hottest days of 2021 summer. Because of COVID, it offered outdoor social distancing to be with friends. I had another ash tree in the front yard. Dave again showed up and said, we can take this one too. Again, no evidence given for being infested. This proposed bill is the first of many steps needed to recognize and disrupt and stop the harm. It has the potential to begin the investment and reinvestment in an urban area that was mapped as a Negro slum in 1935 by the city of Minneapolis. I support this bill to remove the unfair financial burden placed upon me as a new homeowner. I am 74 years old, retired teacher, and $6,500 was a huge hit to my budget. Since 2021, my health has deteriorated due to the high levels of stress that came with removing these trees. My level of anxiety over being targeted and taken advantage of Residents in my community are saying enough. We are done with being targeted and preyed on, preyed upon. We will no longer allow our black wealth to be compromised and stolen. We, myself, neighbors, and other residents are impacted by the ecological harms caused by these mass removals of ash trees. After losing trees to the 2011 Northside tornado that have yet to be replaced, we suffer from a collective root shock from racism, greed, and gentrification. When a neighborhood is destroyed, its inhabitants suffer root shock, a traumatic stress reaction related to the destruction of one's emotional and psychological ecosystem. The ripple effects of root shock have an impact on entire communities that can last for decades. Please support us and me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Our next testifier is um, Felicia Perry. Welcome to the committee, if you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Felicia Perry. Uh, greetings, Senators. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of Bill SF-5191 to address a critical issue affecting overburdened, low-income communities such as North Minneapolis. As I said, my name is Felicia Perry, and I want to share my testimony regarding um, the unlawful removal of ash trees on privately owned property by the Minneapolis Park and Rec Recreation Board. The bill does address the entire state. Equity, however, means that we support the black and brown communities of North Minneapolis who have been disproportionately impacted. The financial burden on residents is staggering. While nearby cities like Robbinsdale are effectively managing their ash tree population at a fraction of the cost, 
Minneapolis residents face bills averaging $2,000 or more per tree removal. For comparison, Robbinsdale invests $75 per tree for treatment, highlighting a gross disparity in cost efficiency. I'm here before you today as a victim of this injustice. NPRB billed me $4,985.33 for the removal of a single tree on my property, threatening my home with an assessment if immediate payment is not made. The toll goes beyond financial strain. I've dedicated countless hours attending meetings, researching and advocating for myself and my neighbors who cannot be here, experiencing unchecked intimidation by the park board and Department of Forestry staff for attending public meetings. This ordeal has underscored a profound mismanagement of the tree removal process in Minneapolis particularly disproportionately impacting constituents who can least afford it. As we discuss this bill, I urge you to consider and advocate for retroactive compensation to cover the entire costs associated with the unlawful removal of our ash trees. It's imperative that accountability be upheld and a full repair for those who have been harmed. I thank you for your time and your attention to this pressing matter. <clears throat> um, thank you very much, um, um, Ms. Perry. Um, Senator Dibble, final comments? Um, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. As you can tell from the testimony, the, uh, the kind of financial pressure that folks are under is, is tremendous. Um, and the public interest is very, very high in making sure that we're dealing with this infestation. Um, you know, uh, like I said, I think all we can do at this point is try to slow the, the progress down of the infestation. Maybe time bought um, will help us uh, come up with other kinds of policy solutions, uh, financial and, um, and scientific and other kinds of interventions. Um, that's what we can hope for. But in the meantime, we need to do what we can um, to try to help people get these trees removed um, or treated. Uh, as was suggested by some of the testimony, and um, and do what we can. So, and like I said before, um, the bill as proposed is is scalable, of course, um, and so we can try to focus it in in ways that that might be prudent as we move forward. Maybe even just to get a toehold this year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. Seeing no for further discussion, Senate File um, fifty one ninety one will be laid over. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, much. members. Welcome to the committee, Senator Rest. Senate File 5110 is in front of the committee, and you have an A2 author's amendment. Senator Rest offers the A2 as an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A2 Senator is adopted. Senator Klein, I wanted to speak to that, but I'll do so now. Um, Senator Rest. The amendment that we uh, just put on, thank you for doing that. Um, uh, addresses the issue of um, <clears throat> an effective date, um, which we don't usually see as a, um, a specific um, amendment like the one we just passed, um, but it does have significance for, um, for this bill. Um, we are currently under a moratorium um, agreed to in the 2023 
tax bill regarding um, uh, local sales tax um, initiatives. And so we have uh, not heard any local sales tax bills or any modifications to sales tax bills, local sales tax bills um, this, this session. Uh, we are going to be hearing a, um, uh, a bill uh, that um, reflects in part the work of the local sales tax advisory uh, committee that was chaired by Commissioner Marquardt. Um, the House and the Senate are taking um, different pathways to that, so it is not going to be a single bill with um, um, with House companion a House companion. Um, they're going to be two separate bills, and um, depending on the actions of our respective taxes committees, that will um, the differences will be um, resolved in. Um, uh, in conference, um, but it's going to be two separate bills for a comparison rather than rather than uh, attempting to what we might call pre um those bills. So they're coming up um, next week. But although um, uh, we have gotten advice, and it's really, it might not seem like much to some, but it is very important. We have gotten, particularly to uh, Representative Gomez and myself, um, we have gotten advice that um, says because the ballpark tax is in, was required, required Hennepin County to impose it, it was not necessarily a local, it was not a local um, uh, sales tax. And so we really didn't, wouldn't um, need to um, um, specify that the in, date of enactment is the day following the um, uh, uh, the sunset of the of the um, uh, of the local sales tax moratorium. Um, uh, it's kind of a belt and suspenders um, approach to make sure that everything is, um, uh, that there's not going to be a technical reason, such as a moratorium, uh, which some might say is more than a technical reason, but nevertheless, um, that we uh, do not run afoul of that in, um, in our um, efforts to um, continue the ballpark tax um, and repurpose its, um, its, or some, at least some of its, of its uses. Right now, the ballpark tax is um, 0.15 um, uh, percent that is imposed um, in the county, and um, it serves a number of different. Um, a number of different purposes. The main one, of course, is to pay off the debt. And um, because the, um, the economy uh, has been um, generous to us, um, the, um, the, it is anticipated that the, the bonds will be paid off um, uh, many years uh, before um, they um, come uh, uh, the the end point, so they can be defeased perhaps as early as two years from now in twenty in twenty twenty six. And so it was it was um, um, conversations began between uh, Hennepin County and and the. Um, um, and the twins and other and other special interests about the possibility of continuing the tax and repurposing some again of its uh, uses, and that is what this proposal, Senate File, um, Senate File, fifty one ten uh, represents. So I'll go through it um, quickly, um, but section by section. Um, however, even in that context, you will note on the revenue estimate that um, the Department of Revenue does not 
um, attribute a cost to doing this because the funding is simply a, um, not simply, but the funding is a, um, a sales tax um, uh, modification. So, um, so what are they proposing to do? Um, first of all, and I'm, uh, you can look at the bill or you can look at the, at the, um, uh, the summary prepared by uh, uh, Senate Council, uh, <clears throat> uh, recalling that it has been um, some um, 18 years since it was um, imposed um, as a requirement for the um, uh, for the uh, uh, target field to be um, constructed and an agreement to pay for it, um, and it is um, under the um, jurisdiction of the um, Minnesota Ballpark Authority, although it is a sales tax that is that funds it that is a um, uh, that is again imposed by Hennepin County. So the Ballpark Authority is um, acknowledged in this bill as the um, qualifying government, if you will, for this long-term um, investment. And what it does in, um, so that, that is reaffirmed in section one. In section two, um, um, there are additional uses for, a, um, for the sales tax um, beyond the period at which the bonds will be um, defeased, which we um, assume, again, could be as early as two years from now. So it allows for uh, grants for um, uh, capital improvements to the, to the ballpark. And I think we know that um, uh, major league um, uh, uh, venues, whether they're um, of any major sport, um, are in not only um, uh, is maintenance a, um, a huge feature of them, but um, always keeping the, um, the, um, the ballpark um, uh, looking fresh and looking as if, even if it's 20 years old, um, that it looks like it's, it's brand new. And that is a responsibility not only of the teams that play in these venues, but also of the responsible party, and in this instance, the, um, the ballpark authority. So um, that's what happens in section two, that capital improvements of the ballpark or public in infrastructure within the development area of the uh, of target field um, grants to uh, accomplish that. Um, those those um, projects would be um, would be um, available. Um, however. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the second player in this is um, uh, Hennepin County, and in Section Three, <coughs> um, there is now new language, uh, which really does constitute uh, a, <coughs> a new use. Um, let's see, um, um, Mr. Bergren, could you bring me my water bottle, please? <coughs> <coughs> So in section three, um, uh, to the extent that funds are available, <clears throat> um, there are, um, <coughs> excuse me, certain um, certain projects <coughs> also for which per, for which um, projects may be funded. And I draw your attention to lines 2.8 through 2.15. Um, and this um, really does um, flip the coin. And what we have found um, throughout the metropolitan area is um, a dire need for upgraded um, health care um, facilities, and certainly um, no more so than at the, um, the three um, level one trauma centers in, uh, in the metropolitan 
area, um, HCMC regions, and uh, North Memorial in, um, uh, in Robbinsdale. So um, the first one is to um, uh, develop, construct, improve, equipped, county-owned, or operated healthcare facilities. Um, secondly, to, um, to provide public infrastructure um, determined by, by the county to facilitate that, that development, uh, to, <clears throat> to have a uh, reserve account, and also um, other purposes related to health care facilities. Um, number four probably needs a little bit more attention um, because it is a, um, a catch-all, and we might want to look at um, having that language be much more specific than is that is in um, than is in uh, reflected in in um, page two, line thirteen, and then um, um, the um, the funds that are um, that are authorized <clears throat> are related to the county's um, um, capital improvement budget. When we um, first um, um, pass this bill, and, and um, it's neither here nor there, but um, I didn't vote for it back then. Um, uh, we had in that bill a um, um, also an, an obligation to support um, two, pu two truly um, public purposes unrelated to, um, to baseball. And, and they are continued here uh, with youth, youth sports and, um, and, um, and, library, uh, and library services. In section um, five, um, there is uh, just some deletion of language uh, which limited initial, the initial expenditure um, limitations. In subdivision six, <clears throat> the um, um, our favorite word comes up uh, in this committee, beginning something with notwithstanding, um, which always means we should be looking very carefully to anything that begins notwithstanding. So I want you to look at that carefully. But um, the, um, uh, the county is allowed, notwithstanding any other kind of uh, limitations, to make uh, grants uh, to the baseball park authority uh, for those capital improvement um, expenditures. In in section uh, seven, um, the county um, is permitted to um, acquire um, by uh, different means, including not just purchase, but by eminent domain. The county has the power of eminent domain. Um, um, or any other way, <laughs> um, uh, gifts, lands, air rights, property interests, etc., cetera, um, to, um, uh, uh, that are within the county for the purpose of the health care facilities that they are, um, that they are considering. In um, Section 8, um, there is just a, um, a reference to other laws the laws from 2006 regarding the, the uh, ballpark. In section nine, um, um, the um, ballpark authority, which is now the government that other than, than, uh, than Hennepin County that is referred to in this bill, um, that is allowed then to fund capital reserves and to make capital impro improvements. Um, in section 10, beginning, um, Changes in the agreement, um, or in and in the law passed in 2006, one 5.31. Uh, um, how how is it to be uh, funded? And they um, um, the the county may use revenue bonds. Uh, they're not always um, um, the best source, the most reliable source, the most dependable source, but they are. Uh, they're going to be allowed um, under this um, under this bill for the purposes that I described at the beginning. Um, 
there's a lot of language there, but they are, it is just detailing the kinds of arrangements that uh, the county may enter into with the use of those revenue bonds, um, the kinds of contracts that it, that it needs, um, um, et cetera. Um, section um, 11 is um, a um, uh, references to, to other um, sources of the um, uh, other parts of, of the law that controls the ballpark authority and the and Hennepin County and um, it um, um, allows once again and this is an important thing for for you for you all to to look at um, this is now an extension of um, an additional 30 years um, the bonds that were let um, uh, based on the 2006 bill um, was um, for, was for 30 years and we are at the point of um, defeasing those um, some um, whatever the arithmetic is <laughs> um, some eight nine ten whatever years um, earlier and but so this as I understand this language um, it is starting anew a 30-year 30 a 30-year period um, with the effective date of this bill so um, this tax um, continuation of this tax um, if we um, uh, the the effective date of the of um, from June 2nd 2025 would be able to be um, uh, captured and imposed for 30 more years on uh, to um, uh, June 2nd of, um, of 2055, which um, is certainly going to be beyond um, a number of us uh, <coughs> in this on this committee. And then in section 12, um, the ballpark authority now, when it was originally passed, had to um, pay uh, two two million dollars for um, for the uh, reserves for the capital improvements, and that has been um, uh, increased under this document to thirteen point five million dollars, um, and the um, the team share, which was originally a million dollars has been um, increased to $4.5 million um, uh, a year. And, um, and then it's also going to be uh, those payments, just like in the original agreement, are going to be subject to um, um, an inflation, an inflation um, factor. So Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, that is the um, proposal that is um, that is before us. Um, we are going to um, um, consider it today. I have no other amendments. We have some testifiers. Um, uh, and um, as this bill moves forward, um, my plan would be to um, include it in the, um, the omnibus bill where further work can be um, uh, done on it and um, um, for things that we may consider to be, uh, la language needs to be tightened up um, and defined better at, at some points. Um, it is my understanding that, that the, um, both the um, ballpark authority or, and Hennepin County and, um, uh, and the Minnesota Twins organization um, are in um, support of continuing this um, this sales tax and for the purposes that I have uh, just outlined. So at this point, if there are any questions, fine. Um, but um, 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 certainly would like um, to have the witnesses speak as well. If we could have uh, Chair Fernando and Administrator Howell come forward.
Welcome to the committee, <laughs> Board Chair Irene Fernando. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Chair and Senators, <clears throat> my name is Irene Fernando. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm Chair of the Hennepin County Board. I first want to thank the bill author, Chair Rest, and the many co-authors for support of this important legislation. One of Hennepin County's top legislative priorities is to ensure our residents can access high quality and accessible health care. Hennepin County is unique in our ownership of extensive health care facilities to serve our residents and the state of Minnesota. At these facilities, we provide the entire spectrum of care for patients. This includes a multi-specialty medical, dental, and mental health center and human services at North Point Health and Wellness located in North Minneapolis, a behavioral and chemical health facility at 1800 Chicago that strives to keep people with mental health and substance use needs out of jail and out of hospitals, a mental health center on Lake Street to improve the mental health of adults and children with serious mental illness or emotional disturbances, Minnesota's largest STD and HIV clinic called the Red Door Clinic, a medical examiner facility that investigates over 10,000 deaths annually and serves Hennepin, Scott, and Dakota counties, as well as the state's only publicly owned safety net hospital, Hennepin Healthcare, also known as HCMC. HCMC never turns away patients, no matter their insurance, financial situation, or complexity of their need. It's a level one trauma center for both adults and pediatrics, the busiest emergency room in the state, and an essential teaching hospital for doctors who go on to practice across the state. These facilities are a critical resource for our residents and the entire state. As these assets age, the county will need additional funds to maintain and upgrade these facilities to continue our high quality standard of care and our commitment to patients. In so many ways, the health outcomes for all Minnesota depend on a well-run, extensive county health system. <laughs> we are asking for your support to repurpose the county's one-eighth cent ballpark sales tax to support county-owned healthcare facilities now and into the future. About 80% of the revenue, or 800 million over the next 20 years, will be invested into these facilities. A portion of the revenue will continue to maintain the publicly owned target field, sustaining the strong public-private partnership with the twins for the next generation. And will continue to fund youth activities and library hours that has, that since its enactment, has generated $74 million for the community. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Chair Fernando. Mr. Howell, please introduce yourself and proceed. Senator Klein uh, and Senators, thank you. Uh, I am. David Huff, I'm the head of county administrator. Good morning. I have to speak louder. All right. Good morning, and thank you. We want. I too want to uh, reiterate thanks to Senator Rest for being the chief author and the other co-authors on this important piece of legislation. Hennepin County strives to ensure all residents have access to high-quality, accessible, and culturally responsive health care. We promise and promote the long-term vitality and innovation in the county's safety net healthcare systems. Hennepin County is the principal public agency responsible for providing healthcare to our low and moderate income residents. Uh, we provide a system, an entire spectrum of care for patients from neighborhood clinics to uh, chemical crisis services, mental health services, EMS services, and a premier level one trauma center for adults and pediatrics. We have, as I said, mental health facilities. Uh, the county owns many uh, facilities across the county, including Hennepin County Medical Center, HCMC, North Point Health and Wellness, a medical examiner's facility that is uh, a relationship to, that serves Dakota, Scott, and Hennepin, we have the Red Door Clinic, as Commissioner Fernando stated, our mental health center, a behavioral health and, and uh, chemical health facility at 1800 Chicago, and a system of 18 primary and retail care clinics across the county. These facilities serve Minnesotans far beyond the borders of Hennepin County, uh, stretching across the metro region and the entire state of Minnesota. As these assets age and the healthcare industry changes, the county will need additional resources to maintain and provide state-of-the-art facilities to continue critical 
services and provide access to care. We have identified more than $1.5 billion in upgrades over the next 15 years needed for H the HCMC campus alone. As Senator Ress stated, in 2006, the legislature approved the 0.15% sales tax in Hennepin County to help build the Target Field ballpark and surrounding public infrastructure. Almost 20 years later, the public is the owner of a multi-purpose sustainable ballpark and has spurred significant development uh, in downtown Minneapolis and brought over 30 million people to the ballpark. Because of strong financial management, Hennepin County will pay off the ballpark uh, bonds more than 10 years early. In fact, the center arrested uh, potentially in the next couple of years. Without legislative action, the sales tax will be turned off. We are excited about the, in the innovative strategy that you have before you. We are asking the legislature to repurpose the sales tax to support Hennepin County owned healthcare facilities and continue to maintain the ballpark through uh, this legislation. As was stated, 80% of the projected revenue, or $800 million over the next 20 years, will be reinvested and invested in critical county health facilities to ensure residents have access to high quality and culturally responsive health care throughout uh, our system. As part, of, uh, as part of the deal, Hennepin County will contribute $9 million annually to the Ballpark Capital Improvement Fund will maintain and preserve Target Field, a publicly owned asset. The Twins will contribute 4.5 million annually to capital maintenance and fund any above and beyond improvements to the ballpark. <coughs> they also extend their lease in the ballpark for an additional 20 years through 2059 <coughs> with two additional 10-year lease extensions available. Additionally, the county will be able to continue to fund youth activities and library hours for another generation, continuing our commitment that was made in the original legislation. And as Commissioner Fernando stated, we've expended over $74 million for these very important purposes. So we see that this is an elegant solution to address the long-term the long capital needs for these very valuable state and county assets. We think it's a win-win-win and we thank you again for the opportunity to testify here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Huff. Could Ms. Stella Whitney West please come forward? Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair, Senators. Uh, my name is Stella Whitney West, and I'm the CEO for North Point Health and Wellness Center. So North Point is a multi-specialty primary and preventative health center. We provide medical, dental, behavior health services. We also have a pharmacy and a full service laboratory on site. We are anchor and legacy institution in North Minneapolis and our roots date back to the Great Society from the Lyndon Johnson administration. We serve communities most impacted by structural racism, historical trauma, and poverty in the country for over 55 years. We are a national health service corps site. And this means that healthcare providers, doctors, dentists that work at North Point are eligible for loan forgiveness. This allows us to recruit top talent from across the country. We are close to finishing a comprehensive expansion project to meet the growing health and social service needs of the community that we serve. I want to share with you the major investments that Hennepin County is making in North Point's healthcare infrastructure. We have developed an integrated service model which utilizes client and patient focused multidisciplinary teams to provide integrated services. This model proves that you can design a system that increases productivity, efficiency, patient satisfaction, all in service to improve health outcomes. Central to our approach is addressing the structural problems on a population level that lead to poor health and chronic disease. North Point is a source of health and quality care and a critical part of our state. 
Over the years, our community of care has seen increasing improvement rates for child in vaccinations, cancer screenings, mental health, and dental care treatments. The county embarked upon a three-year, $100 million campus redevelopment and expansion plan. We are almost finished, and when done, North Point will provide increased access to quality and innovative health and wellness services, expanded space for clinics and programs, more employment, and economic development opportunities. We will be able to serve more patients and clients more efficiently and in a more integrated manner for decades to come. This project also extends its reach into the community, providing major physical, economic development opportunities by working across multiple sectors, including public, private, health, housing, food, and transportation. We've maximized small business inclusion in our contracting process and deepened community involvement in our project workforce. The expansion project is an example of the county stepping up to meet the needs of North Point and the community and the people that we serve. We believe that all Hennepin County needs resources and facilities like this. Our impact is real. When the county invests in high quality health care, infrastructure, people and communities benefit. Each one of the county's 1.3 million residents deserves quality care. I'm proud that we've ensured that residents of North Minneapolis and the communities that we serve will get that at North Point. This bill will ensure that North Point will be supported and available for future generations. This bill will ensure that the entire county has access to modern, comprehensive health infrastructure. In closing, I want to invite you to join us May 18th for the ribbon cutting so that you can see for yourself our facility and the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whitney West, and thank you for the excellent work that is done by North Point Health. Uh, online we have uh, Mr. Adam Dunning. Mr. Dunning, can you introduce yourself for the record and proceed? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, for carrying this important bill. My name is Adam Dunnick. I'm the President and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council and Downtown Improvement District. And I want to speak to the significant benefits of Senate File 5110 as we think about reimagining the future of downtown. Hennepin County is a leader in downtown Minneapolis and our state when it comes to providing a social safety net for all, as you heard from Commissioner Fernando and Administrator uh, Huff. In 2023, Hennepin Healthcare moved up and became the top employer downtown, reporting over 7,200 employees. And when combined with Hennepin County at large, the number of employees downtown adds up to 12,850. The Senate file 5110 will position Hennepin Healthcare and their vision as care providers, community asset, and a neighborhood center for jobs and wellness. Furthermore, the ballpark component of this bill is also important for the future of downtown Minneapolis. The Minnesota Twins are a first class community partner and one of the strongest proponents of a thriving downtown. And like all of our sports teams, the Minnesota Vikings, the Timberwolves and Lynx, the Twins, they're all champions for a strong downtown, understanding the connection to making it a vibrant state. And the, uh, the administrator walked through some of the attendance numbers, so I won't report those, but just seeing a two, just about 2 million attendees last season at Target Field is exciting, and knowing that we're gonna to continue to build on that kind of activity downtown. And the lease extension of 2059 is emblematic of the ownership of the Twins organization's commitment to downtown. At the Minneapolis Downtown Council, we have seen firsthand the Hennepin County's essential partner and national leader when it comes to issues such as homelessness, mental health and treatment, health care and trauma response, as well as economic development and community development. This legislation connects all of these important issues. Minneapolis Downtown Council and Downtown Improvement District strongly support it, Senate File 5110 and the efforts to invest in high quality health care system, asset preservation, public infrastructure, as well as all the jobs, economic activity, and, and community development that come along with it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Dunnick and members. We, as Senator Rest mentioned, we have representatives from the Minnesota Twins here who don't plan to testify, but are available for questions. Are there member questions or comments for the author or the testifiers? So our rest closing comments. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. I want to 
um, especially thank um, uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Fernando for uh, working on this this project and in her conversations with um, uh, with the Minnesota uh, Twins on behalf of the Hennepin County Board. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we will um, be, um, um, with, with your consent, laying the bill over um, for, um, uh, to continue to, uh, to look at the provisions in it. Uh, with that, Senate File 5110 as amended is <coughs> laid over. Members, we now have in front of the committee Senate file yeah, and, five and, uh, two. Uh, Senator, uh, um, please don't bring up the amendment. <laughs> okay. um, Senate file five two three five. Senator, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, every year we get a proposal from the Institute of Public Finance that um, looks at uh, various improvements or getting rid of obsolete um, provisions with the way in which um, uh, government projects are, uh, are financed. And uh, this year um, is, no, um, is no different. However, um, all but one provision in this bill is actually under the jurisdiction of two other committees. And so what we have asked the, um, what we have asked is for um, the other two committees to consider informally um, the provisions that um, pertain to their jurisdiction. And in a moment, after I explain what they are, we're going to delete them from this bill for that purpose. Um, we're hoping that they um, again, we'll uh, informally uh, review them and publicly review them. Um, and then whatever um, changes or suggestions for improvement, we would take that under advisement to then include them back into um, the article that is generally referred to as a public finance um, article. Um, but just briefly to review what they are before, before we take them out, um, and to indicate that there's, um, these are uh, uh, no cost um, to, um, to the state. So there's no um, the fiscal, there's no fiscal note, but, but there is, the revenue estimate is, um, is, um, is zero. So um, sections one through three deals with um, financing issues related to to uh, school districts, and um, we have asked the um, uh, Committee on Education Finance, Senator Kunesh, for her committee to uh, review them. And in particular, um, there are some clarifications about re requirements in section one um, um, uh, about contracts, and they're not they're not effective until the school district has made a, um, a final decision. Um, in section two, the, uh, it was uh, considered um, by the parties that um, 60 days before a referendum was uh, too short a period, and, and so it has been extended to 88 days before a referendum that the um, school board publish a summary um, of the uh, commissioner of education's review and and comments about that pro about their project, and um, as we know, in some fundings for um, uh, school buildings, a referendum is not required, um, and the publication notice. We're clarifying in here that the publication notice about the project. Um, is um, uh, does not apply if no referendum is is uh, uh, going to happen. The third section deals with uh, lease purchase ar arrangements, and um, uh, indicates that 
the uh, review and comment requirements uh, apply to projects that have um, an expenditure of greater than a half a million um, if, the, um, if the school district has a capital loan that's outstanding um, or a much higher amount, $2 million, if the school district does not have a capital project. So those three sections will be reviewed by the, um, uh, by the Committee on Education Finance. Uh, section 4 would stay here in the Tax Committee, um, and it um, is a definitional issue, modifying, changing the definition of um, a debt obligation that will um, just add, if you look at the bill, it just it adds a, um, um, find that, it adds um, um, to all the things that can be done on um, page four, uh, lines one and two, it adds that a, um, a courthouse or justice center that if connected to a jail, uh, correctional facility, or other law enforcement facilities comes under that, um, that section. And then um, uh, sections um, um, five and six, um, there's something called the Bond Allocation Act, which applies to bonds that um, may be authorized um, um, by economic development authorities, and there's a there's a huge there's a, not huge there is, there is an amount, and then it is allocated um, to be dealt with by first of all, generally. Um, uh, entitlement ent entities, and not just mean uh, entitlement doesn't mean they get something for nothing. It usually means that it's limited. An entitlement user is a limited um, is a limited user, and then um, <coughs> section six um, <coughs> also um, um, clarify is a clarification provision, and it uh, for residential rental projects project allocations um, <clears throat> for, the, for the period in which an issuer uh, must permanently issue those obligations. And so those two sections um, are under the um, uh, jurisdiction of the Housing Committee. And then Section 7 um, is an application for all other types of, um, of qualified bonds. So with that explanation, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would, um, I would move to um, the A1 amendment that deletes sections 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6, and 7 for review from the appropriate jurisdiction committees that I mentioned as I went through the bill. Senator Rest moves the A1 amendment. It is an author's amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A1 is adopted, and we are left with just Section 4, I believe, of Senate File 52. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is um, that is this year's bill from the um, Institute of Public Finance, and um, uh, we would consider um, after after these those provisions have been reviewed by the appropriate committees of including um, the whole bill with. Um, with any um, suggested improvements in in the um, um, as we consider um, the omnibus bill, Chair Rest, I believe we'll go to testifiers now. Can Mr. Joe Bagnoli and Ms. Rhonda Scobie please come forward? Welcome to the committee, Mr. Bagnoli. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Joe Bagnoli with Winthrop and Weinstein on behalf of the Minnesota Institute of Public Finance. Uh, as I, I don't, we don't have really anything to add. 
Uh, so I, support uh, we support uh, we support Chair Rest Bill, <laughs> and uh, and mostly are thankful that she has again agreed to carry the bill. I I can tell uh, the committee and Chair Rest that before um, my colleague uh, uh, Ms. Scobie were here, we were over in the Senate. Uh, uh, education committee, and we did uh, hear the, uh, for informational reasons, heard the heard the three the first three provisions of the bill, um, and seemed to go very well. Uh, with that, um, if there's any questions for us about details in the bill, um, Ms. Scobie is a, a bond lawyer and uh, works in the area. Thank you, Mr. Bagnoli. Ms. Scobie, did you have testimony? <laughs> Welcome to the committee, Ms. Scobie. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Rhonda Scobie from the Minnesota Institute of Public Finance and Dorsey and & Whitney. And uh, I won't take your time up repeating what, uh, what Senator Rust and, and Joe Bagnoli have already shared, um, but I testify in support. And happy to take questions about any particularities uh, of bond law or, uh, or the the tax rules that we're talking about today. Thank you, Ms. Scobie. Members, questions or comments for the author or testifiers? Chair Rest. Uh, members, Senate file 5235 as amended is laid over. And Senator Klein, you may um, adjourn them. Committee is committee. adjourned. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for your time.